I am Dr. Duminda Munidasa, the President of Ceylon College of Physicians. It's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you all to this uh, our uh, specialty update of the Ceylon College of Physicians for the month of March 2023. Today we have the pleasure of having the collaboration with Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists, especially uh, Dr. Bodhika Samarasekara, the president, I am very thank my co-chair today. I am very thankful to you, Bodhika, for joining with us and your council and the members uh, to collaborate with us today. And uh, so it is we'll, uh, welcome our first speaker. Today we have a speaker from overseas, Dr. Leon Griffin the consultant respiratory physician from Glenville Hospital, Wales, UK, joining with us. Dr. Griffin completed her higher specialty training, gaining dual accreditation in respiratory medicine and general internal medicine in August 2020. Currently, she works as a consultant respiratory and general medicine physician in a district general hospital within the Highway Dada uh, the University Health Board in Wales, UK. She has a subspecialty interest in interstitial lung disease and currently works to expand the ILD service within the health board to include the developed research opportunity for the patients. And Dr. Leon, thank you very much for joining us. A very early morning must be for you. And uh, hopefully weather is doing well for UK now rather than last few weeks. Uh, so, Leon, you can start with your presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for, for inviting me to speak. Um, it's not too early early here. It's about, about 7.30, so, so not too bad. It's a pleasure to, to join you this morning. Um, so, yes, I, I uh, work in a district general hospital in a place called Carmarthen, um, which is in West Wales. Um, uh, in, in the UK uh, and the West Wales area is, is beautiful. There's lots of beautiful beaches, countryside castles. Um, but in addition to that, there's also lots of um, exposures that the people of West Wales are at risk from. Um, and these include smoking, uh, roughly 14% of the UK population still smoke. I believe that's not too dissimilar to, to uh, Sri Lanka. Um, there is lots of farming with it being a rural area. Farming is quite prevalent within West Wales. Um, and there's lots of um, pollution, road pollution, pollution from industry. Um, there are areas that there's, um, Historically, there's been power stations for which we're now sort of seeing the effects. They used asbestos, for example, extensively in the power stations up until the 1980s and 90s. And we're seeing former workers present with all forms of asbestos related lung disease from pleural plaques, mesothelioma and asbestosis. I haven't really covered asbestos related lung disease in this presentation as it's quite a large topic. Um, and I understand that in Sri Lanka, cases are not as prevalent as in the UK. So I've hopefully focused more on conditions that you might see more commonly. Um, so in this talk, I've split exposure related lung disease into airways disease and interstitial lung disease. There have been some new guidelines and clinical statements released in the last few years relating to the diagnosis and management of these conditions. 30 minutes is quite a short time, but hopefully it'll give you a flavor of each of these sort of guidelines for you to familiarize yourselves if you're not, um, not already. Um, I think the main thing I'd like to get across um, is the importance of taking a good exposure history when you see any, any patients with lung disease. And the first and most important step in treating any of these conditions is the remove, removal of that offending exposure when we're able to identify it. So firstly, looking at airways disease. So chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is responsible for 3 million deaths worldwide. Tobacco smoke is um, 
responsible for up to 70% of these cases with the remaining 30% attributable to pollutions, both indoor and outdoor pollutions. And I believe you have a talk on the effects of indoor pollution a little later on. The inhalation of smoke or pollution res results in repeated injury and repair, leading to structural and physiological changes within the airways and lung. Um, the inflammatory and structural changes in the lung increase with disease severity and persist after smoking cessation. The main components of these changes are narrowing or remodeling of the airways, leading to a reduction in FEV1 on spirometry testing, an increased number of goblet cells and enlargement of mucus secreting glands of the central airways, and that can give a chronic bronchitis type picture. Alveolar loss and emphysema, and finally vascular bed changes, which can lead to pulmonary hypertension. The, the graph highlights the decline in FEV1 over time. So this is adapted from a, an old article over 30 years ago, but I think the, um, the points are, are still relevant. Um, so it's normal to see a reduction in FEV1 as we age, and the top line depicts that normal decline between the ages of 25 and 85 years of age in non-smokers. And if you compare that to the much steeper gradient in, in smokers, um, you'll note that if patients continue to smoke, then before the age of 70, they are usually significantly disabled by their um, lung disease. The decline um, does continue. Um, if they stop smoking sort of before around the age of 45, the, it does still decline, but you'll note that the gradient is much more similar to that of a non-smoker. Um, and therefore um, the mortality reduces. Um, and smoking cessation is um, one of the only management options for COPD that affects mortality. The inhaled treatment that we all prescribe reduce symptoms in some patients and can help reduce the frequency of exacerbations. And we know that exacerbations can result in a faster decline of FEV1, increased morbidity and increased mortality. So the management therefore is centered around improving and treating symptoms and trying to prevent these exacerbations. Um, goals. Um, which is the Global Initiative for Obstructive Lung Disease. Um, they're an organization that works um, with, with global organizations to um, research and guide the management of COPD. They write a report annually um, amending their, their guidelines and recommendations, and it is, it's worth reading. So in the, in the 2023 report, patients are categorized um, slightly differently to previous years um, depending on symptoms um, and their frequency of exacerbations. And then these, these patient categories are used to guide pharmacological treatment. So following identification of chronic airflow obstruction, so that's a post bronchodilator FEV1 of less than 0 0.7, we would categorize patients into um, gold a, um, and that those are patients with few symptoms, so a, a low MRC score um, with less than two exacerbations per year. Gold B, so they are um, a bit more symptomatic, so have a higher MRC score, but again, low uh, number of exacerbations, so less than two per year. Are those that exacerbate um, more frequently are, are grouped together in, in category E. Um, and those have at least two exacerbations in a 12 month period or one exacerbation that has required admission to hospital. And those patients are grouped together regardless of how symptomatic they are in between exacerbations. Um, so treatment should always start with lifestyle adjustment. So removal of the exposure, i.e. smoke and cessation, or try to limit indoor or outdoor pollution if possible. Um, try advising exercise and trying to remain as active as possible, refer to pulmonary rehabilitation classes, um, and advice on maintaining good nutrition and keeping up to date with seasonal vaccines would be 
um, sort of generic advice for all patients with, with COPD. But when we think about inhaled therapy, we go back to the, the classifications of, of um, group A. Um, so, uh, so those are patients with, who don't exacerbate and have very few symptoms. And um, Gold recommend a lab, a long acting beta agonist or, or a LAMA. For those patients who are a bit more symptomatic that again don't exacerbate, then you would combine those therapies. So a LABA LAMA combination inhaler, for example. For those that um, exacerbate more frequently, um, then Gold recommend triple therapy. So your LABA LAMA with an inhaled corticosteroid. Um, and other uh, factors that you might consider when um, considering an inhaled corticosteroid would be in those patients who have an eosinophil count of greater than 0 0.3 um, or those with a concurrent diagnosis of chronic asthma. There is um, an emphasis within the report and this should be carried out, uh, sorry, carried over into clinical practice that treatment should be reviewed regularly, including um, inhaler technique and adjust the treatment if necessary. If patients remain symptomatic despite inhaled therapy, then there are additional pharmacological treatments that are mentioned in the report. For example, the use of macrolides such as azithromycin um, in those that frequently exacerbate um, and were former smokers or um, or reflumolast in, in those with a chronic bronchitis type picture with severe obstruction and an FEV1 of less than 50%. The report also mentions additional therapies. So those that are symptomatic despite um, pharmacological treatment. Um, and they mention um, uh, procedures such as lung volume reduction. So for example, endobronchial valves. These are one-way valves placed into the airways via bronchoscopy um, and aim to reduce the burden of um, emphysema or bullous disease to induce atelectasis um, and allow um, other parts of the lung to take part in gas exchange. And this option could be considered for patients with significant burden of emphysema who have a high residual volume and are symptomatic despite the therapies we've already discussed. Endobronchial valves have been shown to improve quality of life increase FEV1 and reduce symptoms, but they have no effect on mortality and no effect on the frequency of exacerbations. Lung transplant is also mentioned um, and the UK are lucky enough to have a national lung transplant service. And it can be an option um, for slightly younger COPD patients. So those typically less than 70 years of age um, who have stopped smoking for at least six months. Um, with few comorbidities, but advanced COPD. And patients with COPD currently make up roughly 28% of those who are registered for the lung transplant in the UK. Moving on to interstitial lung disease. So ILD is an umbrella term for a group of conditions that cause scarring of the lung parenchyma. So that's the space between the alveolar membranes and the epithelial cells of the capillaries. Inhalation of the exposure or antigen or chemical um, can lead to small airway and parenchymal lung injury, which then invokes an inflammatory response, um, usually from macrophages and pro-inflammatory pro cytokines, that's then followed by a period of repair can include fibroblast proliferation, which results in sort of thickened, scarred um, lung interstitium. And clinically that's demonstrated by a restrictive deficit on spirometry and um, impaired gas exchange, so a reduced TLCO. Differentiating between interstitial lung diseases is a challenge. So the respiratory symptoms are non-specific, shortness of breath, dry cough, they have crackles on examination. Um, and so in view of that, there should be a much larger focus on the history and identification of exposures, including drug history, occupational history, the home environment, etc. And of course, um, associated multi-system extrapulmonary symptoms and signs that may indicate an underlying autoimmune not connective tissue disorder. 
examination is really helpful in differentiating between ILDs, except for those who have specific autoimmune or connective tissue disease signs. And it's the radiology really that's that's key. Um, so hypersensitivity pneumonitis um, is a granulomatous inflammatory reaction to an inhaled antigen to which the patient has been previously sensitized. Not, it's not completely understood, but is thought to involve type 4 T cell mediated immunity and granuloma formation and type 3 hypersensitivity immune complex formation. Um, the, the list there is, is by no means exhaustive, um, but is just to demonstrate some organisms um, and potential organic antigens, um, such as bird protein, mycobacterium avium complex, for example, um, and, and chemicals such as nitrofurantoin can cause um, hypersensitivity and pneumonitis. So the American Thoracic Society has updated its guidelines on the diagnosis, course and management of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And this algorithm is taken from um, a European Respiratory Society journal that's based on the American guidelines. Um, there is a large focus on exposure history, radiology and bronchial viola lavage to demonstrate um, a lymphocytosis which would indicate um, an inflammatary process. And with the bronchial alveolar lavage, we ask for a cell differential count. Um, and so a 15% lymphocytosis would be suggestive of an inflammatory process. In, within the guidelines, there is a heavy weight on multidisciplinary team discussion. Um, and often a diagnosis can be made following MDT discussion with the first three pieces of information. So the exposure history, the CT, and the bronchoalveolar lavage result. Occasionally a surgical biopsy may be required, but due to the associated morbidity and mortality, this should be an MDT decision. So what does the what are the radiological features of, of HP? Um, well, there's usually an upper lobe predominance, not always, but, but usually an upper lobe predominance. Um, and the, the reaction to inhaled antigens leads to bronchiolocentric inflammation, which on CT can be seen as centrolobular ground glass nodules. Um, inhalation of an antigen affects the small airways, which causes narrowing of the small airways um, by that inflammatory process. And that then may cause um, air trapping, so retains air in, in the, the end lobules, um, which on expiratory scans, um, these, those lobules appear darker and, and is known as air trapping. This diffuse interstitial inflammation um, leads to an increase in lung density with visibility of vessels and bronchial walls, and that is called ground glass opacification. And then in hypersensitivity pneumonitis, there's usually a mixture of these um, features. So the lobules of um, darker appearance of air trapping mixed with ground glass and other lobule, lobules of more normal appearance. And that pattern of mixed, mixed lobules is called mosaic attenuation. So this CT scan is, is one of my patients who is a 55 year old lady um, who kept budgies birds at home. She presented um, with a relatively short history, a six week history of progressively worsening breathlessness, a marked reduction in lung function with a forced vital capacity of 55% predicted and a TLCO of only 35%. She went on to have a bronchoalveolar lavage, which demonstrated a 34% lymphocyte count. And her CT was um, predominantly inflammatory. So I'm not sure how well it projects, but there's evidence of sort of central lung nodularity, a lot of ground glass opacification, um, and some lobular sparing here. Um, so she was discussed at MDT and with the exposure history, the CT findings and um, the bronchoalveolar lavage result, a diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis was made. She was strongly recommended to rehome the 
the birds. Um, the main, the first point of treatment for any exposure related lung disease, as we've said, is removal of the antigen. So she did rehome the birds. Um, and due to the significant impairment in lung function, we started on corticosteroid treatment. And she had an excellent response, both symptomatically and radiologically, and is now back hill walking, which she enjoys. The CT is the same lady before she started on treatment um, and it's the coronal projection um, and it's just to demonstrate the upper low predominance and the relevant sparing of the bases. So hypersensitivity pneumonitis can progress to become fibrotic um, and these CTs are of an 84 year old patient of mine um, who lives in a very damp house with lots of mould and he presented with progressive breathlessness over a few years. Um, a restrictive deficit on lung function tests. And he went on to have a bronchoalveolar lavage, which demonstrated a 33% lymphocyte count. On the CTs, you can see progression of, of course, interstitial findings, some septal thickening, um, accompanied with, by some ground glass change. And following um, MDT discussion, it was felt he had a diagnosis of fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. He was started on immunosuppression initially, but unfortunately didn't tolerate the medications and is now on antifibrotic treatment. And I will just um, talk a bit more about antifibrotic treatments a little later on. So in the guidelines, there's been a move away from the old categorization of acute, subacute and chronic HP. The American guidelines now recommend describing the phenotype as non-fibrotic or primarily inflammatory or fibrotic, which can also have an inflammatory component. Um, and the, the, to differentiate, the two can be helpful to determine prognosis. There's no established algorithm for the pharmacological treatment of HP. It may initially respond to corticosteroids, but um, the long-term benefit of um, corticosteroids to slow progression of fibrotic HP, for example, um, is unknown. Um, and there are concerns around um, the risks of, sort of long-term immunosuppressants, although they are used, um, but the evidence base is, is poor. Um, antifibrotics are used for fibrotic HP. Um, and I, like I said, I'll, I'll talk about that uh, a little later. So, um, Granulomatous inflammation um, occurs via an immune response to a foreign trigger. Um, and usually macrophages are, are usually involved. So they are specialized cells in clearing extracellular debris through phagocytosis. And they recruit other immune cells. Um, and they're typically found in granulomas. They release inflammatory cytokines and can clump together um, to form multinucleated giant cells capable of cytokine secretion, including TNF-alpha. Causes of granulomatous inflammation in general, as we've said, is, um, can include infections, um, antigens, exposure, drugs, autoimmune conditions. The trigger in sarcoid is unknown. Um, genetic factors are thought to play a role, and in some cases, in certain infections, including mycobacterial and fungal infections, but there are some other associations um, and, for example, following the World Trade Center disaster in 2001, there was an increase in the diagnosis of sarcoidosis in, in patient people who were exposed um, at the time. Um, and there are other studies that have also found um, an increased risk um, of sarcoidosis in those exposed to metalwork and combustible wood. There have been clinical statements issued recently from the British Thoracic Society and the European Respiratory Society outlining diagnostic pathways and treatments. And this table, um, the, the guidelines um, make suggestions as to whether uh, patients require biopsies or whether um, confident clinical diagnoses can be made based on radiology and clinical history alone. Um, the types of biopsies we may think about include, um, for pulmonary sarcoid, include um, nodal biopsies, so, so EBUS, endobronchial ultrasound for mediastinal hyalonodes, 
Um, if there's any sort of neck nodes, we could um, consider biopsying those or, or transbronchial biopsies. But there are certain clinical presentations, such as Lofgren syndrome, where a biopsy is not indicated. Lofgren syndrome is that, uh, as you know, a triad of bilateral hyla lymphadenopathy, joint pains, and erythema nodosum. Um, this is often self-limiting, and so treatment isn't always indicated either. Um, but I think it's important that whether you're biopsying these patients or not, um, you know, it's important to ensure clinical and radiological stability or improvement, so they do need regular follow-up. This is an example of one of my young patients who presented with, with Lofgren syndrome. The x-ray on the left um, demonstrates the bulky hyla lymph nodes, um, and the x-ray on the right is six to nine months later um, and shows resolution of the, of the hyaloid, so she's got the hyla angle back. Um, she didn't require steroid treatment, um, but was followed up regularly to ensure that things were improving quickly. Um, this CT scan is another of my patients um, with sarcoid. So he's a 38 year old man. He has no known identifiable exposures. And this is just to demonstrate some of the radiological features of sarcoid in addition to the lymphadenopathy. So here you can see this bronchocentric nodularity and ground glass opacification. Um, with some visual beading, so they're little nod nodules along the fissure, um, which are typical of sarcoid. So, as mentioned, in the last two or three years, the American Thoracic Society, European Respiratory Society, and British Thoracic Society have all published clinical statements regarding sarcoidosis, covering diagnosis and management. Um, and they they discuss sort of indications to treat in sarcoid, which include end organ damage or high risk disease with a risk to um, organ damage or, or death um, and impairment of quality of life. Um, the risks of treatment need to be balanced against the side effects, which are, are not insignificant. Sarcoidosis is generally thought to be a benign disease because the outcomes are usually good, but there is um, an increased mortality in um, sarcoid population compared to that of the matched general population with a mortality rate of about 5%, usually from respiratory or cardiac involvement. So if you see a patient and determine them to be at high risk, you'd usually start on, on corticosteroids um, with a uh, wean over about four to six months. Um, and then if the patients are unable to wean, they have significant side effects from them, or they progress despite taking steroids, then we would think about second line agents. And methotrexate is the more widely used second line agent, but there's no superiority over azathioprine. Um, again, these treatments carry a significant side effect profile um, and need to be monitored regularly with, with blood tests. If there's evidence of progression despite second line treatment, then biological therapies can be considered. So we mentioned that one of the pro-inflammatory cytokines um, associated with sarcoid is, is tumor necrosis factor, and therefore anti-TNF agents are used such as infliximab. Lastly, I just wanted to mention some occupational lung diseases, um, include, and these can include silicosis, beryliosis, exposure to beryllium, and coal workers pneumoconiosis. So we used to see coal workers pneumoconiosis quite frequently in South Wales. We don't see it so much anymore. <clears throat> there were lots of coal mines um, until the 1980s. Um, I understand that uh, in Sri Lanka, you see um, far more cases of silicosis than, than, than we do in the UK. Um, so I have to admit, I, I don't have any patients with, with a diagnosis of silicosis under my care, but it a, was a disease of miners, but more recently um, manufacturing of artificial stone bench tops used in kitchens, for example, um, and sandblasting genes have seen an increase in cases in, in different parts of the world. And uh, silicosis is split into acute or chronic um, with acute silicosis occurs following exposure to high levels of crystalline silica over um, a relatively short period of time and can pre present with non-specific symptoms of breathlessness, respiratory failure, 
and does carry a high mortality. Chronic silicosis is then split into simple, um, the radiographic features of which is mainly nodularity, which is seen in the picture, um, which you can see here. Um, and there may be some lymphadenopathy as well. These patients can be um, asymptomatic. Um, and then chronic silicosis can also um, be split into, into um, complicated silicosis, which describes a state where the, the nodules enlarge and form, to form a um, conglomerate, um, which sometimes leads to progressive massive fibrosis, which is seen here. So all of these sort of interstitial lung disease um, can progress to a progressive fibrotic phenotype despite um, immunosuppression and removal of the antigen in some cases. Um, and so we consider the use of antifibrotic therapies in this group. And this was born out of the inbuilt study. So we've been using antifibrotic treatment, nintedinib and perfenidone for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis for some time. And the inbuilt study looked at the use of nintedinib for non-IPF patients who demonstrated progressive fibrosis. Uh, the study included 663 patients who met the criteria for progressive fibrosing ILD. Um, and that criteria was a 10% reduction in um, force vital capacity, evidence of radiological progression over two years, or a worsening respiratory symptoms with a 5 to 10% decline in force vital capacity. And patients were given either nintedinib or placebo. The primary endpoint was the decline in FVC after one year. Um, and as you can see from the graph, the rate of decline in the nintedinib group, which is the top line, um, was roughly 80 mils per year compared to placebo, which was 170, sorry, 187 mils per year. Um, which was statistically significant. The study didn't differentiate between different ILDs. They grouped them all together um, if they had the progressive fibrosis phenotype. But since then, there's, since the inbuilt study, there's been subgroup analysis, which has suggested that the effects of nintedinib are consistent between the different interstitial lung disease with progressive fibrosis phenotype. The other antifibrotic um, perfenidone Currently, we're unable to use in the UK for this group of patients. Um, we use it for IPF, but we're, we're not able to use it for um, progressive fibrosing patients at the moment. We have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, hopefully that will change soon. Um, but essentially the relief study looked at um, perfenidone versus placebo in non-IPF patients with progressive fibrotic phenotype. It was a double blind randomized control trial um, and unfortunately was terminated early due to poor, poor recruitment. Um, and so the, lung, the results do need to be taken with some caution, but there did appear to be a slower rate of decline in the FEC um, in the perfenidone group. So I think take home messages. Um, the air we breathe isn't, isn't safe for all patients. I think the, the treatment for any exposure related lung disease is the removal of the exposure if known and possible. Um, and so taking a thorough exposure history is so important and will help with the diagnosis, treatment and prognosis of your patients. Thank you, Leanne, uh, for that excellent uh, talk on exposure related lung diseases. Uh, now the uh, lecture is now open for discussion. You can ask questions. Can I ask you one question? Um, how do you decide the duration of uh, this non-fibrotic uh, HP treatment, chronic HP especially? Duration of treatment. Um, so, if, if so, treatment um, may, depending on the the presentation, I guess of the of the patient, the so the impairment of lung function, uh, impairment of lung function, the um, symptoms the patient presents with, um, and 
if the antigen is known. So treatment may not be indicated if you, you've got a short exposure to an antigen there's relatively limited impairment in, in lung function um, and you're able to remove the, the, the antigen. Um, and in, in those cases, if the patient is re relatively well, then I would regularly follow up. Um, I perhaps not start on treatment, but um, make sure that lung function and, and symptoms are assessed regularly. If I was starting on um, corticosteroid treatment, then um, I would usually start with, with half a milligram per kilogram of, of, of prednisolone um, for a, a sort of a three to four week period and, and wean um, over um, sort of th three to four months um, and, and re reassess at that point. So if there, if there is, um, if the antigen has been removed and the patient's had a good response, then I, I might um, stop treatment and um, again reassess off off the treatment. If there's ongoing exposure, then usually the patients need um, ongoing ongoing treatment um, with with regular review. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Dr. Griffin, another question regarding uh, especially hypersensitive neuronitis. Uh, now, how do you decide uh, that this patient is not responding to corticosteroids? And when will you decide to start on a second line therapy? And what are the usual treatment options that you have at our disposal? Um, that's a good question. So, um, in terms of deciding whether patients responding or not, um, I, I usually base that decision on, on symptoms, which can be subjective. Um, so I, I take that into account with, with radiology. Um, so I, I might sort of repeat x-rays, for example, in, in clinic, um, but um, importantly with lung function tests, so monitoring the force fighter capacity and gas transfer. Um, and so if there is a deterioration in um lung function uh, despite corticosteroid therapy then um, that would be an indication for a second line agent um, if the patient is having side effects of corticosteroid therapy and they have ongoing um, exposure to the antigen um, and are likely to need need treatment then um, but but are not tolerating steroids then i would start um, second uh, a second line agent um, and the, the sort of the choices that we would usually start with is something like mycophenolate, mofetil or azathioprine. Um, those, in, in, in practice, those, those are the ones that are, that are generally used, but um, the evidence base isn't, isn't as strong for, for in, in HP compared to other ILDs. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, I think, uh, thank you very much for being a resource person for our pulmonology update. For the, on behalf of the Ceylon College of Physicians, we'll be sending you an appreciation certificate by email. And uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. So I'll ask Dr. Bodhika to introduce our second speaker. The second speaker is Dr. Niranjan Disanayaka. Uh, he is the president-elect of Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists. Um, he is currently the consultant pulmonologist at Teaching Hospital and District Chest Clinic, Ratnapura. Uh, he was nominated to represent the SLMA by the Council of SLMA at WHO Southeast Asia Regional Meeting on Air Quality and Health in 2018. And he submitted our recommendations to the WHO Global, Strat Global Strategy on Health, Environment, and Climate Change. His talk will be on uh, the epidemic of Indo pollution. Uh, over to you, Niranjan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 
Dr. Munin, the Dominda Munidasa, President of the Ceylon College of Physicians, uh, Dr. Bodhik Samal Sekara, uh, President of the Sri Lanka College of uh, Pulmonologists. It's an honor to uh, stand in a podium where the CCP and the SLCP is hosting uh, this uh, specialty update. And uh, it's a pleasure indeed to talk about a topic that I'm rather passionate about. So we pulmonologists consider the lung as the center of our universe, and uh, if not the most important organ of our body. So we breathe about uh, 10,000 liters of air per day to help us uh, breathe, uh, to help us produce energy, uh, to obtain oxygen, and to wash out the carbon dioxide that we produce in the process of metabolism. But in that process uh, of taking in air, we take in a lot of harmful substances that are there in the atmosphere, which might be harmful even in minute concentrations, but at the same time might be harmful in certain concentrations, uh, even a normal or a less harmful substance or a useful substance at higher concentrations can be harmful to our body and cells. So hence, uh, air pollution is a very important topic that we can discuss today. And uh, to put the matter in perspective, unfortunately, it is calculated that about 7 million people die yearly. That is about one third of the whole population of Sri Lanka per year due to the direct effects of uh, air pollution. And it can be attributed to that. And out of which, out of nine out of 10 out of them, are from the developing world or low-income countries, and that is very unfortunate, to say the least. So out of the air pollution, we know that even when in a house or indoor environment, if the external environment is already polluted, if your house is situated in, a, uh, in an area where the external environment is polluted, obviously, the internal environment will also be polluted as well. And at the same time, some of the uh, things that we do to create probably heat or cooking purposes, it might leak into the environment to a certain extent. And some processes might damage the environment or the external environment as well. But my topic today would be to discuss about the effects of pollution or air pollution inside our households. Now, uh, unfortunately, uh, this graph basically shows, if you can see the dark blue area, that is the area where there is a significant proportion of the population is exposed to indoor air pollution. And out of the 7 million deaths that we discussed that happens or can be attributed due to air pollution, about 3 million, that is one seventh of the population of Sri Lanka, dies because of or can be attributed to indoor air pollution and effects of indoor air pollution. And we can think about the gravity of the problem. And out of which about 200,000 children dies in a yearly basis, and one of the main causes of them is about 50% of the pneumonia cases in children can be attributed, or deaths due to pneumonia in children less than five years can be attributed into in indoor air pollution. Now, when we come into the local scenario, in Sri Lankan scenario, you can see, see the graph here. In 2019, it is estimated that at least 17,000 people during that year had died or the deaths can be attributed to indoor air pollution, not outdoor air pollution, for so indoor air pollution. So that means about, if you look at it in perspective, or put it in perspective, about 150 people dying per day due to an effect of air pollution. So that is a huge amount, and that's a significant amount, probably more than any other factor contributing to deaths. So the Sri Lankan factor is there causing deaths. Right? Out of which, of this about 150 people who are dying due to indoor air pollution, about 50 of them die because of ischemic heart disease. About 20, of, uh, about 20 to 30 of them 
would be dying because of strokes. About 20 or 30 of them will be dying of lower respiratory tract infections. About 20 will be dying, about 20 to 30 will be dying about because of COPD. And unfortunately, 6%, about 10 people will be dying about with, with cancers. So we can see a large array. Not only the respiratory system is affected, it, is, it, it, can, it can cause cancers to a certain extent. And at the same time, the other important thing is it can be a contributing factor. And it can be a factor that increases the mortality in most of the non-communicable diseases, such as ischemic heart disease, strokes as well. So we can see the gravity of uh, the effect of uh, indoor air pollution in these patients. Right? Now, not only the deaths that we are revealing about, about 89 million healthy life years are unfortunately lost because of uh, indoor air pollution. And you can see this photograph, which is a very common photograph. I, I think we can remember our grandmothers and sometimes even our mothers cooking in this uh, wooden uh, stove. And we were just there around them most of the time, uh, you know, compared to our children nowadays. So what happens is that out of these, the large proportion of people who are affected with indoor air pollution, unfortunately, majority of them are women. And sometimes, majority of them are children and women, because they are the ones who will be there in the house using these uh, substances for cooking. Right, we think that our home is the safest place that we can live in, isn't it? So whenever we are threatened, we go back to our house or homes, right? So even though the definition says that air quality within around the buildings are structured especially with uh, what it relates to the health and the comfort of uh, occupants we define as uh, uh, air pollution, but it is not the acute effect that happens where you can have certain respiratory symptoms or sometimes irritation. But there are certain long-term diseases like the ischemic heart disease or the COPD that we discussed. But at the same time, there are more longer effects that can have, which I'll be discussing in a few uh, minutes. So what about the Sri Lankan situation? So we wanted to, I wanted uh, basically during this talk to highlight the uh, Sri Lankan situation. So now no, we know that millions of people are affected by indoor air pollution. Some of, the, some of them die, or some of the deaths can be attributed to uh, indoor air pollution. At the same time, some of their valuable lives or the working capacities are also lost. So in Sri Lanka, being a tropical country, we expect that, expect, except probably in areas such as New Aurelia where there's a cold environment, we think that probably it is exposed and so the ventilation is better. But unfortunately, most of the studies that have been done in Sri Lanka have shown that their, our indoor air pollution is not second to countries where there is poor ventilation. Right? And out of the substances that we use that causes indoor air pollution, cooking fuel is the most commonest thing that had been implicated to cause a significant amount of pollution inside our houses. Hence, I will be concentrating on cooking fuel because if we understand the effects of cooking fuel and how it affects our health, it helps to understand the majority of the problems that can happen due to indoor air pollution. Right? So we use basically various substances uh, like wood, kerosene, uh, sometimes even dung for cooking purposes. And earlier when the electricity, uh, the penetration was poor and especially probably it came up during the last power cuts as well, we used uh, certain substances as lighting uh, solutions as well. And then, especially in com com communities, especially in the estate community and the higher levels or central hills, because of the cone environment, most of them use various substances, sometimes even plastics, to generate heat to keep them warm. So it is sometimes, it is basically a very socio-economically you know, underprivileged people are most affected of this problem to a significant level. So when we look at the use of firewood or 
uh, biomass for cooking purposes. Sri Lanka comes in red. That means there are about 70% of our population, of our households, use firewood as cooking material. And fortunately, you can see the graph. I know it was about 78% in about 2000 to 2007, but there is a slight reduction only to about 70%. That means three out of 10 households in Sri Lanka use these biofuel for their energy generation, for their energy generation. So it can go up to about 90% in the estate sector, and it can come to about 30% in the urban sector. Hence, certain areas of our population are markedly exposed. And you can see that kerosene is also about 2% of the people are using kerosene. Now, why are we talking about the harmful effects of uh, of uh, indoor air pollution. The most important thing is when you look at the composition of the indoor air, the indoor, uh, that means the combustion uh, fumes of the cooking material that we have, we have a multitude of substances that can be there in any combustion uh, solution or fume. So one of the major things that we would like to highlight is the carbon monoxide. And second thing is the uh, the carcinogen that is called polyaromatic uh, hydrocarbons that are very common, ozone, formaldehyde, and other combinations of substances that are there in the chemical substances in the wood smoke. Right? And one particular important substance is what we call the particle matters, or the PM. Right? Particle matters are very, very tiny particles. PM10 means they are less than 10 microns. Usually, the gravity of the earth doesn't affect it too much. Hence, they sediment in the atmosphere without coming down. So, so the most important thing is this particulate matter, the size of less than 10 microns, it has many, many components. It, ha it can have carbon. It can have, uh, it can have certain metals, such as cadmium, selenium. It can have small amount of water vapor or com uh, combined water vapor. It can have microbes. It can have allergens or various things. But uh, the main feature of this is the tiny, minute nature of the particle. It is about, if you can compare, you can see the blue dot here when you compare with the diameter of the human hair. So if it is 10, we call it particulate matter. And if it is less than 2.5, we call it fine particulate matter. And if it is less than 0.1, we call it ultra-fine particulate matter. So these particulate matter are more dangerous than most of the pollutants that we know today, even more dangerous than sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxide, and even carbon monoxide or ozone, if you think about the consequences of it. And it can be produced by most of the combustion that we undergo in a, in a household environment. So that is a very important fact that we should remember. Right? So these are some summary events of the health effects of uh, certain substances that are there in the air pollution, particulate matter, carbon monoxide, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are carcinogenic, nitrogen oxide, which can cause wheezing, sulfur dioxide again cause wheezing, and then biomass spoke as well. And especially particulate matter has a tendency to affect our next generation as well. And sometimes you can have low birth weights as well. Right? So what is the Sri Lankan situation? Have we done studies? Yes. There are, there are certain studies, unfortunately, that are available at, uh, in our, at our disposal to get some idea about the effect of air pollution, specific, specifically indoor air pollution in the Sri Lankan context. So we have done they have done studies, and most of them have shown that there are significant increases in respiratory symptoms, obviously, that we would expect associated with, uh, with air pollution, indoor air pollution, it be it asthma, allergic rhinitis, and increased hospital admissions. And one special, special feature is that one study has shown, especially done in the Kegol and Kalutara district by Patirat Natal, has shown that it is associated with low birth weight in children. So it affects our next generation as well. Right? And this study uh, done by Naomi Ranatunga et al have shown that we have significantly higher levels of carbon monoxide and PM2.5 concentrations in our households where there is a, where, where the, when we use biomass fuel as cooking substances. And 
in these patients, they have an in increased exacerbation not a rate of infective asthma. So data is also there to say that these patients are affected in Sri Lankan context as well. And this study has shown that there is a significant growth lag, not only the acute events, our children, most of the people who have been exposed to household uh, indoor air pollutions, they have shown that there is a significant growth delay or growth effect of indoor air pollution in these people. So beyond doubt, most of these studies have shown the harmful effects of uh, indoor air pollution, even in the Sri Lankan context. Right? And this is a new study was published in 2022, which has basically shown about they, the, when a patient is using, or people in the population is using firewood as the main source of uh, food uh, preparation mechanism, the prevalence of asthma increases by 10%. Outpair, outcare patient utilization increases by about 33% and in-care patient utilization increases about 17.5%. So it rather, you know, rather than make, you know, it is making the population ill, at the same time, it creates an increased utilization of the resources that are available because of this problem. Hence, it is a health issue as well, not only relevant to certain groups. It's a massive health effect as well, health expense as well. Right. So because there are a lot of postgraduates, uh, now we have understood the, basically the how, uh, the, what are the health consequences and the Sri Lankan context. So this is basically the explanation why these patients have increased allergic components and respiratory health issues. So what we can see here is in A, especially when the patient inhales specially particulated matter, what happens is it goes into the epithelium and through the epithelium, it travels into the endothelial surfaces or interstitial surfaces, and then it activates the neutrophils and the eosinophilic uh, processes of the lung, mainly through interleukin-8, which we know that it's a neutrophilic chemotactic factor, and interleukin-1b, granular, granular formation that is a CSF, uh, TNF-alpha, and interleukin Five. So by these actions, it increases the activation of neutrophils and eosinophils, and we know that both of these cells are capable of having increased, increasing oxidizing potential. And the second one is the antibody-mediated inflammatory response, where there will be uh, basically through CD16, CD22 receptor interactions, there will be anti antibody presenting cell-mediated inflammation in these patients. And the third, or where there we have E, is that specifically these substances, especially the particulate matter 2.5, can change the genes, right? So it doesn't usually cause mutations. It doesn't cause the, the sequence of DNA. But there are histones and other proteins that are attached to the genes, which can be changed by these uh, uh, particulate substances. Hence, the transcription of certain uh, proteins will be uh, made. And because of that, from a Th1 uh, that is a normal milieu, we can go into a Th2 type of uh, inflammatory process where interleukin 4, 5, and 13 will be more predominant, which is abnormal, which is in normal people, the Th1 type is more prominent, but there will be Th2 type of inflammatory response. And we know that Th2 type of response, especially interleukin 4, 5, and 13, is a predecessor for allergic or IgE-mediated, eosinophilic-mediated inflammation in most of the instances. Right? It also causes a significant amount of transcription factor activities, and as the result, it causes cell death apoptosis as well. So we have a huge amount of damage to the airways due to increased permeability, oxidative stress. And other than that, there will be increasing of allergic responses because of the Th1 to Th2 switch because of air pollution. Hence, we can understand why these patients have increased propensity to develop asthma and allergic reactions and respiratory conditions and COPD in the subgroup. Right? Now, this is a very significant slide, I think. Air pollution not affects only us as a population. Probably we are exposed to air pollution, indoor pollution, air pollution today, but our children will have the effects 
and not only our children, because some of these mutations, we call the epigenetic mutations. Epigenetic mutations are basically, in a gene, there are regulatory areas, which are there in the histones and other proteins, and even in DNA, there are certain areas where methylation and ethylization can occur. So these particles, the 2.5 micrometer particles, mainly particulate matter, can change this genetic material for life. And at the same time, because of that, acutely the transcription factors will be different and there will be genes that are coming in cells that are really not needed in that cell. Hence, there might be harmful effects. And at the same time, this can be through the placenta, it can affect the fetus, and through the fetus, it can cause permanent damage or permanent changes in these epigen epigenetic areas. And this can be, if happens in the genetic uh, cells, the, the child can give it to the, his progeny as well. So there is a tendency that this can be go in generations. So effects of air pollution might not end with one generation. It can happen in multiple generations. And it, because of that, they might be prone to respiratory disorders, renal disorders, neurological, cardiovascular, hepatic, and cancers as well. So that might explain some of the poorly understand causes of cancers and other conditions that we deal with on a daily basis, right? So this is a beautiful uh, slide again summarizing the effects of uh, particulate matter, uh, why some of these people have increased tendency to die suddenly, and some of these people have increased in tendency to develop atherosclerosis and other conditions. So the one suggested feature is that it, the, it harms the balance between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. And it activates towards the, it inhibits the parasympathetic nervous system and activates the sympathetic nervous system. So the patient or the person will be under, you know, persistent stress. I, we can understand that probably in the drivers that we have, the 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 three-wheeler drivers and the cells well as the the uh, unfortunately the. Uh, drivers who are in the private buses, right? They probably are under tremendous stress because of this, not because of anything. So they have this uh, imbalance, and that can cause elevated catecholamines, and we know that persistently high catecholamines due to persistent stress can cause significant waste of constriction, cardiac electrical changes, and endothelial dysfunction of these patients. And lung inflammation, as we discussed previously, can also be a significant cause of damage, and it causes systemic inflammation. And this systemic inflammation can leak out to the body and the endothelium, through the endothelium and cause significant cardiovascular comorbidities. And the other important aspect is ingestion, which is a new topic that we have. We are probably you know, uh, regulated by our gut. Okay, probably some of you are now hungry as well. So, so basically, gut, the microbiota of the gut is a very important aspect of our day-to-day uh, -day life, right? So there are changes in the microbiota of the gut when you inhale these particulated matter. And that has been attributed to some of the effects like obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular risks in these patients who are exposed to uh, these substances. So one of such mechanism is that changing the biofilm uh, that can happen and the substances that were previously there were harmless can now become harmful. And this chronic inflammation can damage the, uh, the epithelium of the gut, making it more permeable for certain substances. And hence, these substances can come in to our body and then can affect the genetic transposition of uh, genetic tra uh, changes in the genetic material as well. So this is a very good uh, graph which shows beautifully. So, we have the you know, substances that are there. Some of them get into our body, and we call it gut dysbiosis, and then it gets into the body, and it affects the neurotransmitters as well, and hence some of the psychological disorders, cognitive deficits, anxiety, depression, has also been attributed to some of these particles that we inhale because of air pollution. So it is a very, very interesting area. That, uh, that has huge potential to develop and uh, see in the future. I would come back to this slide again. Whatever we know about the scientific nature of indoor air pollution, the hard fact is at the end, we lose about 17,000 people per year that can be directly attributed to indoor air pollution. So that is a huge number. 
due to a single factor. 150 people per day. So it is time that we should to get together and do something about it. Right? One way of doing it is probably at the source of uh, cooking, we can provide probably uh, the clean uh, cooking of their utensils or substances so that they can use. Probably we have to be very practical about it. If a, if a person uh, is told just to use uh, LPG, they will not use it because some of these patients, we, you, we know that they are afraid to use gas. Some of our even grandmothers, even if they have LPG at home, they don't like to use it due to various reasons. So there might be an effect, you know, if we put a good effort to it, probably we might be able to convince them. Some of them even don't smoke, but they have a lot of incense sticks or mosquito coils causing this particulate matter to come in. And some of the, like mopping, some of the substances that are there in solutions that we use for mop, mopping can cause significant damage as well. And I'm happy to note that this Ministry of Environment have produced this uh, guideline for indoor air quality at the moment. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, finally, then I think we understand the gravity of uh, the indoor air pollution, which is very common in our population. And yes, doctors, we have seen this many, many times. And these patients come to us for, uh, for their illnesses. And they has consequences, acute consequences, to the patient, as well as the family and the society. And at the same time, it has a certain risk to the next generation and the generations to come as well. So together, it is time that we get to know about this problem and to do something about this before we are too late. Thank you very much. Thank you, Naranjan, for that excellent talk on air pollution, indoor, air, indoor pollution. Uh, are the, uh, lecture is now open for questions. There's one question on uh, virtual platform asking what about Sambrani? I think this is Kattagumani. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, Sambrani, actually, Sambrani. I didn't uh, tell it by name, uh, but basically, uh, there was actually uh, Dr. Mundas, one of the patients who came to me about three weeks back. Uh, he was a non smoker with uh, CVS COPD, and he was actually a Kapu Mahatya uh, at the Deval. So he's using Sambrani. So Sambrani basically has a lot of uh, fine particles. Not you know the fine particles that mean the particles that we talk about particulate matter. Now the now the uh, concentration is on these fine particles. So any substance that can generate fine particles has the potential to damage the lung, not only the lung but the cardiovascular system and the body as a whole. So Sambrani is definitely if you uh, use it in a unconditional or a unregulated way, probably it is a huge uh, significant cause of. Uh, air pollution, indoor air pollution, and health effects as well. Yeah. And Niranjan, we know like, uh, you know, the mosquito coils, burning yeah. mosquito coils uh, is very toxic. I mean, yeah. it's uh, more toxic than a cigarette, like yeah. eight, it's equal to 80 cigarettes. Like. Yes. So are there any studies in Sri Lanka um, with yeah, regards to mosquito What I have seen, Bonita, exact, uh, yeah, the, uh, now, as you correctly said, the 80 times more toxic means that uh, basically if you look at certain substances that are yes. there in the, uh, the uh, mosquito coil, especially again particulate matter, yes. right, uh, is very, has, it has a higher concentration because most of these mosquito coils have a little bit of organic component as well. So because of that, it has a very high concentration of particulate matter. And uh, whether we have studies done exactly relating this, I'm not very certain. But there is a study that has shown in Sri Lanka uh, around in 2013 to 2015, about 10 to 12% of the households have used uh, mosquito coils in a regular basis. And some of the thing that the most important thing is that now, the, now we, thought, uh, we talked about uh, using uh, firewood in the, uh, in the areas, in the, in the rural and the state areas. But in the urban areas, uh, so some of the significant causes of air pollution are uh, Samrani incense sti sticks and uh, the other indoor air pollutions like the biological things that are there in a, in a room. So uh, especially in the urban environment, it is certainly a cause, yes. I think public awareness is very important. It's the, it's the most important thing the because... the media, they don't like to... Yes. ...publish yes. these things. 
and they keep the especially because of mosquitoes they keep yeah. the doors shut and they okay. don't allow the ventilation to happen as well so that is a problem that we have to face in a daily basis yes thank you Naranjan, for that yeah that's a that's a good question actually now uh, now if you if you wear masks that means if you use a normal n95 mask uh, that we used uh, during the COVID process, it can prevent uh, substances that are less than point, you know, more than 0.3 microns. So if you take more than three microns, uh, certain the part of the less than 0.25 microns will also be not be uh, going into our body. So, but the problem is, uh, one thing is, uh, masks are very expensive in 95. Wearing a normal mask will not give you the protection because it has many leaks, as, as you know, even for infection, it, it does not give a little bit, lot of protection. But uh, if you wear an N95 mask properly, certain parts of this particulate of matter can be prevented from entering. Uh, so up to about uh, 0.3 microns. So, but the problem is, now, exactly. when we look at it in a practical way, uh, N95 mask is probably around 700 to 800 rupees, a good one. And the LPG is about, uh, at the moment, it's about 4,000, isn't it? <laughs> 5,000. So that's the issue. <laughs> 4, so, uh, you know, so that is the thing. So, but if you have to go to an environment which is really, really polluted, and if you're worried about it, and if you're saying uh, for a short duration of time, I think N95 mask will give you some protection against pollutants, yes. But indoor pollution, like, again, it is not practical. Not you know, practical, yes. Yes, uh, uh, alternative the mosquito recoil. Vaporizes? Does it that? There's a question on vaporizes. Vaporizes again. Uh, you know the, the the issue is about. I haven't actually seen any studies about vaporizers, uh, to be honest. But uh, when you look at vaporizers, what we usually do is it has volatile organic components. That means a volatile VOC, so volatile organic components is compounds is the substances that are usually uh, evaporated at uh, room temperature. And some of these substances have been shown to be having carcinogenic effect as well as uh, some adverse effects as well. So if we have an option and if we, do, if we don't have an option, better than a mosquito coil, I think vaporizer is a good solution, provided that we provide adequate ventilation in that room. Uh, but it is not 100% uh, perfect or safe. What about kerosene? Is it uh, kerosene also? also yes. If you, if you look at the kerosene, we, we usually don't. The problem is that we usually don't combust this, or you know, at, at completely we don't uh, uh, you know burn it. If we completely burn it, the product that we have is carbon dioxide and uh, water in most of the hydrocarbons. But because of the partial combustion, most of them will leave soot, carbon particles, and uh, diluted particles. And if this kerosene has some solutes that are you know, impurities like sulfur and nitrogen compounds, when it's burning, it can cause sulfur dioxide and other nitrous compounds. So it is not very safe. Kerosene is definitely not safe. Is uh, air fragrance you put in sometimes in the, the car yeah. and when you... Yeah, air fragrances are definitely, yeah. yeah. These are all substances that are volatile and especially mopping. Uh, I think our female colleagues will be very interested about it because the pine-scented and the citrus-scented ones has a con compound called linoleine, and uh, when it creates, it, when it interacts with ozone, uh, some of uh, the substances are very harmful to the health. So and what they say is, if you are cleaning the thing, open up the environment and uh, do that, rather than allowing it to stagnate, but it's a two-way sword. If you open up, ozone will also come in. So sometimes it increases the harmful effect of these uh, mopping solutions. Yeah, so we harmful in the sense, sorry, harmful in the sense for neoplastic problems. Yes, or is it yes, as well as it can cause inflammation as well in the lung. Okay. Thank, thank you, you Naranjan, for that excellent talk. Right. Thank you. Uh, yes. Next, we have a case-based discussion presented by Dr. Heshani De Silva. Uh, and will be this with the expert comments from Dr. Saman Kularatna. Dr. Heshan De Silva is graduated from Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo in 2015, and currently works as Senior Registrar in Respiratory Medicine at National Ho Hospital for Respiratory Disease, Valisara. And as you all know, Dr. Saman Kularatna uh, obtained his MD Medicine in 1998 and was board certified at Consultant Chess Physician in 2000 and currently works as a senior consultant chess physician at National 
Hospital for Respiratory Disease at Velisara. So we'll start with Heshani. Over to you, Heshani. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction, sir. Uh, I'd like to thank the Ceylon College of Physicians, uh, as well as the Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists for providing us with this opportunity uh, to present at this forum. Uh, so the topic today is uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, an overlooked cause of dyspnea. Uh, so, I'll be discussing a few cases that we have come across at Valley Sara uh, over the past few years uh, with slightly different presentations. Uh, so, our first patient uh, was a 64-year-old male uh, presented to us with a five-year history of progressive shortness of breath. Uh, so, this patient had been intermittently been on inhalers by a GP and uh, he was a non-smoker and he didn't have any evidence of or any features of connective tissue disorders. Uh, the patient didn't have a history suggestive of anemia, heart failure, or renal or liver disease. And uh, on uh, exposure history, uh, it was uh, uh, found out that the patient was employed uh, in mushroom cultivation. So he had been doing this job for the past seven years. And uh, examination uh, showed bibasal end inspirated cre fine crepitations without any evidence of clubbing. And then with these in mind, we went ahead with our evaluation. So although he was not hypoxic at rest, he had a significant desaturation on the six-minute walk test. And uh, the lung functions also showed a restrictive pattern. So there was reduction in the FVC and FEV1 with a normal ratio and a low DLCO. So with these, we went ahead and did an HRCT. So if you can see uh, the HRCT, you can see that uh, uh, there are diffuse ground glass changes. And you can also notice that there are some areas uh, with centrilobular nodules. Uh, apart from that, there is a mosaic attenuation, and then the expiratory films show some air trapping and some evidence of fibrosis. So this CT was reported as a chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So considering our patient's history, evaluation, and the radiological findings, uh, we gave a diagnosis of uh, chronic hypersensitive pneumonitis with the probable exposure of mushrooms. And so this was a case of mushroom workers' lung. So moving on to our second case. So our second case was a, a female. She was a 45-year-old lady. And she presented to us again with a chronic history of dyspnea uh, going on for three years, which was associated with non-productive cough. Again, this patient didn't have an exposure to smoking, uh, didn't have any evidence of uh, connective tissue disorders or any features of heart failure. And uh, her examination revealed that she had clubbing and uh, she also had bibasal end inspiratory crepitations. So this lady was also employed in a company which was uh, uh, producing uh, coconut shell spoons. So she was mainly involved in uh, polishing these uh, coconut shells, and so she was exposed to the dust. So again, her six-minute walk test showed a significant desaturation, and lung functions were also restricted with a low DLCO. So this is the HRCT image of this patient. Again, uh, so there was, a significant, there was a significant fibrotic component, but again, uh, diffuse ground glass, uh, not uniformly, uh, apart from that, there were uh, definite areas of mosaic attenuation and air trapping, all features uh, suggestive of hypersensitive pneumonitis, and this was reported as subacute HP by the radiologist. Uh, so now I'll move on to my, la my third case. So this case has a slightly different presentation, and I'll go into a little bit more detail. So this lady, this was a uh, housewife, a 52-year-old lady, she presented to us with a rather acute or subacute history. So she had a history of progressive exertional dyspnea, MMRC grade one for four weeks duration. Uh, this was also associated with non-productive cough and she also had some constitutional symptoms like loss of appetite. There was no fever, no wheezing, and uh, there was no history suggestive of bronchial asthma, COPD, uh, ischemic heart disease or heart failure. And uh, again, she didn't have any features of connective tissue disorders and there was no exposure to long-term drugs. So on uh, asking her about the exposures, so she had, uh, although she, she didn't have any exposures within her own compound, her neighbor was a chicken rearer. And so there were about 20 to 30 birds uh, in the neighboring house, and uh, this exposure had been present for the past six months. 
Apart from that, she also had an exposure to passive smoking. So with this in mind, we went ahead with our examination. And uh, so our patient was not cyanose. There was no clubbing, no features of connective tissue disorders. Uh, the patient was dyspneic uh, with a respiratory rate of 24 cycles per minute. And uh, the patient had evidence of bibasal fine end inspiratory crepitations. Uh, she didn't have any evidence of pulmonary hypertension clinically. And so with that, we had, uh, went ahead with the rest of her evaluation. And uh, so she was not hypoxic at rest. So her saturation was 95. But when we went ahead with the six-minute walk test, there was a significant desaturation from 95 to 70%. And the distance that she could walk was also significantly reduced. So ABG also confirmed that there was evidence of type 1 respiratory failure. And with this, we went to the rest of the evaluation. And uh, the full blood count didn't show any eosinophilia. CRP, ESR, marginally elevated. Uh, echo, a 2D echo didn't show any evidence of pulmonary hypertension. And the uh, rheumatoid factor and the ANA theta was also negative. So this is the X-ray of the patient. So if you can see, uh, there are predominantly hyla uh, interstitial shadows. Uh, and uh, with this history and uh, the uh, clinical features and the chest x-ray, we were thinking of a diagnosis of acute hypersensitive pneumonitis. So with that, we went ahead and got our HRCT done. So if you can see, these are the upper cuts uh, of the HRCT. So you can very clearly see that there is diffuse ground glass as well as areas of central lobular nodules. Apart from that, there are also some areas of muscle attenuation. So these are the lower cuts. And here, the expiratory films are also in. Uh, uh, you can see the expiratory films as well. There's clear areas of air trapping. Uh, but there was no significant evidence of fibrosis on this. Uh, so with this, we went to the lung function test also. Again, as expected. There was a reduction in the lung volumes in the FVC as well as the FEV1 and a significant reduction in the DLCO. So DLCO was 50%. So we went ahead with the bronchoscopy and did a bronchoalveolar lavage. And the cellular content was quite high. There were 810 cells. And of that, 45% were lymphocytes. Uh, so a lymphocyte count of more than 30% is highly suggestive of chronic HP if there is a co uh, uh, if there is a history and the rest of the features suggestive of that. Uh, so we diagnosed this patient uh, with an acute HP, and uh, we went ahead with the patient's management. So the main thing was to advise the patient on avoidance of the exposure. So she was able to discuss with the neighbors and explain the predicament that she was in, and uh, they were willing to uh, get rid of the animals that were there. Apart from that, uh, because she had a significant desaturation, we also started her on immunosuppressive. So she was started on prednisolone and tailed over a few months. She was also advised on passive smoking. So following the course of prednisolone, we repeat her HRCT. So if you can see, the first two images are before treatment, and the last two images are after treatment. And there's a significant improvement. The ground glass changes have improved. The central lobular nodules have improved. And if you see the lower lung shadows, you can see that the mosaic continuation uh, and the air trapping also, there is some improvement. And there is definite improvement of the ground glass. So the lung functions and the six-minute walk test were also repeated following treatment. And if you can see, there is an improvement in the lung volumes, as well as an improvement in the DLCO. And then now the patient didn't have any evidence of exertional desaturation. Uh, so the patient was quite happy with her, uh, uh, with her progress. And so unfortunately, uh, she defaulted clinic follow-up for about two years. So following that, she presented uh, quite recently, again, with similar symptoms. So this time, again, the symptoms were going on for two to three months duration. And uh, the exertional dyspnea was of MMRC grade two. She didn't have any constitutional symptoms. And on uh, extended history, it was revealed that uh, the cages that were used to keep the chickens were still persistent in the next compound. Uh, and so we assume that this was the exposure that was leading to the patient's uh, presentation. So again, examination was similar to previous findings with only bibasal end inspiratory crepitations. And uh, in the evaluation, the six-minute walk test had a significant desaturation. And the lung volumes, uh, the lung function test showed a reduction in the lung volumes with a low DLCO. We went ahead with the bronchoscopy and a ball again. 
But here we saw that the cell count was relatively low and the lymphocytes were only 15%. So we repeated the HRCT again. And if you can see here, uh, there, are, there are ground glass changes and central orbital nodules as seen previously. And there are some fibrotic changes here as well. Especially in the lower cuts, you can appreciate that there are new fibrotic changes which were not present in the initial presentation. So with this in mind, uh, we managed the patient and uh, we gave her proper advice on avoidance of the exposure. And so we were able to explain that they need to get rid of the cages also because there can be particulate matter which can exacerbate the hypersensitive pneumonitis. So she was started on uh, immunosuppressive agents, systemic corticosteroids. And because there was a significant component of fibrosis also in the HRCT images, uh, she was, uh, it was decided following the MDT that the patient needed to be on antifibrotic agents also. So due to availability issues, the patient was started on perfenidon. So currently the patient is on this treatment and uh, we are awaiting the repeat HRCT to see the response. So I have just gone through a few cases that we have come across uh, over the past few years at our unit at, in Valley Sara. And uh, my consultant, Dr. Saman Kulratna, will uh, follow on with the discussion and the evaluation of HP. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Munidasa for inviting us here. And Dr. Bodhikar, uh, my senior registrar, my first senior registrar, uh, for, uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity. And um, so I would like to uh, just go through the, the hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And thanks, Heishini, for presenting some of our cases uh, in the clinic. Now, hypersensitive pneumonitis, uh, although uh, not uncommon in our respiratory units, uh, we uh, rarely see referrals from medical units uh, because uh, I think some of these uh, patients are overlooked because uh, they have a similar other uh, conditions uh, mimicking these uh, hypersensitive pneumonitis. So we rarely get referrals suspecting hypersensitive pneumonitis. And uh, if you look at hypersensitive pneumonitis, these are uh, the, the first one to demonstrate hypersensitive pneumonitis is an Italian medical professor who has uh, demonstrated uh, uh, HP cases in 1713. Uh, HP is a complex and heterogeneous interstitial lung disease that occurs when susceptible individuals develop an exaggerated immune response to an inhaled antigen. Uh, so exposure to a wide variety of organic particle, particles are responsible and uh, which uh, reach the alveoli. The size may be less than uh, five microns. And various antigens have been uh, described uh, uh, in the literature. Uh, hundred of uh, uh, the, the agents. Uh, these agents could be microbial, plant, avian, animal-based proteins, inorganic low molecular weight chemicals uh, that combine with host proteins to form heptans. And uh, this exposure can occur at home, uh, workplace, or in uh, recreational environments. So I'll go through some of the, the, the instances or examples and you all are familiar with farmer's lung. It's due to mold decay. Uh, the offending antigens may come from aspergillus species or maybe uh, from some uh, bacteria. And then bird fancier's lung, it is due to the antigens from feathers and uh, bird droppings. And mushroom worker's lung, it is uh, thought to be due to thermophilic actinomycetes. And then humidifier's lung, the mist generated uh, by a machine from standing water, uh, contaminated with various bacteria, fungi, and MEMEB. And uh, the antigens from uh, these agents uh, will uh, cause humidifiers lung. Then uh, mycobacterium avium complex is responsible uh, uh, in patients who develop uh, HP uh, associated with hot, hot tubs. And then the mist uh, generated while you know this is metal working uh, fluids uh, the non tb mycobacteria are responsible here and then miller's lung the wheat um, miller's lung the dust contaminated grains 
contaminated with this wheat, uh, we will is responsible for the uh, HP there. And I have some example here, the bird fancier's lung. Uh, I had uh, one patient uh, who came with uh, uh, the, all the features suggestive of uh, hypersensitive pneumonitis, we confirmed by radiology. And this patient had the exacerbations, and we couldn't find any cause for the uh, HP here. But uh, uh, it went on for two years. And finally, the patient uh, developed chronic respiratory failure and died of uh, respiratory failure. And uh, later on, we came to know that she was using a pillow uh, uh, contained this, uh, the bird's feathers. Uh, what has happened there is the patient has worked in the um, uh, Middle East and she has brought, the, uh, brought this uh, pillow, and, but patient was not aware of this bird uh, feathers. So in HP patients, when you manage it, and each and every time when they get admitted, you have to go into the details of uh, uh, exposure. This is the proposed mechanism in pathogenesis of hypersensitive pneumonitis. Normal people will have a normal reaction uh, with the uh, exposure to antigens. Uh, others with uh, genetic and environmental promoting factors will develop alveolitis and with uh, granulomatous inflammation and with some progressive factors, the, they, they go on to develop fibrosis. So pathogenesis of hypersensitive pneumonitis, the people have described some genetic factors and uh, there is some viral uh, etiology, uh, viruses will trigger or exacerbate hypersensitive pneumonitis uh, to environmental antigens by increasing the antigen presenting capacity of alveolar macrophages and decreasing the clearance of antigens and also stimulating the release of inflammatory cytokines. What about the roles, uh, role of uh, cigarette smoking? HP is um, uncommon in smokers but the smoking can drive the pathogenic process towards the fibrotic disease. So HP in smokers it's a, uh, will be a chronic clinical cause and uh, they will have more recurrent episodes and uh, they will have a significantly poor survival rate. So smoking, always we have to get them to stop smoking in patients with hypersensitive pneumonitis. Uh, HP is a disease of uh, many phases. Some of them will present with uh, inflammatory self-limiting disease. Some can have relapsing disease and some may be having a progressive inflammatory disease progressing into chronic fibrotic uh, lung disease which is similar to IPF. Uh, if you look at the classification now in the, the past we were describing um, hypersensitive pneumonitis uh, acute, subacute, and chronic presentations, uh, but uh, this uh, doesn't show any. This uh, doesn't uh, give any idea about the progression of the disease. So nowadays, people are more concentrating on uh, the cellular and the fibrotic types of hypersensitive pneumonitis. Uh, to give some idea, now acute HP, which is characterized by an influenza-like syndrome occurring a few hours after. A, uh, usually a substantial exposure. They will present with fever, chills, malaise, cough, chest tightness, dyspnea, and headache. And these symptoms gradually uh, decrease over, hour, over hours, days, but often recur with uh, re-exposure. So the people tend to diagnose these patients as acute respiratory infections, especially the mycoplasma infections and the viral infections. So you can uh, easily miss these uh, acute presentations. Uh, if you look at the chest X-ray in the acute presentation, it could be of normal. Uh, those who have changes, they will be having bilateral uh, perihyloid opacities, uh, mid and lower zones, uh, but uh, with sparing of the costophrenic angle. So again, uh, you will consider the possibility of viral and the mycoplasma infections there. Then the HRCT, uh, if you get the date for HRCT and delay the HRCT, uh, you might miss all the di diagnosis because by that time everything may have uh, disappeared. And if you do HRCT on um, the patients who have normal uh, chest X-ray, you can uh, 
uh, catch half of the patients with uh, acute presentations. So HRCT will show, as uh, Heshini mentioned, the central tubular ground glass and poorly defined nodular opacities. Then subacute HP, although you can't demarcate the, the acute from subacute, uh, may result from repeated uh, low level exposure to inhaled antigens. Uh, it is uh, characterized by an insidious onset of dyspnea, fatigue, and cough uh, that develops over weeks uh, to a few months. So in general, subacute HP is a progressive disease with persistent cough and uh, dyspnea. Again, uh, there are a lot of differential diagnosis. We have to think of infectious pneumonias and all the other interstitial lung diseases. So uh, any patients with uh, interstitial lung disease, uh, always you have to consider uh, the HP as a possibility. Uh, the acute and subacute HP can also be associated with wheezing, bronchial hyperresponsiveness, and uh, a normal uh, chest radiograph. The chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, many patients have no recogni recognizable acute uh, episodes. They present as a slowly progressive chronic respiratory disease, progressive dyspnea, cough, fatigue, malaise, and weight loss. And some of these patients can have digital clubbing, which is associated uh, with poor uh, prognosis. Again, uh, the TB and other chronic infections like fungal infections, uh, uh, you may diagnose uh, as, uh, you know, the chronic HP you might uh, mistake as a sputum negative PTB. So the latest guidelines for the diagnosis of HP propose that the patients be categorized as having non-fibrotic or purely inflammatory HP or uh, fibrotic HP, uh, mixed inflammatory and fibrotic or purely fibrotic disease. So proportion of these patients with fibrotic HP uh, develop a progressive phenotype characterized by worsening fibrosis, decline in lung function, and early mortality. So the diagnosis of HP, uh, you have to have a thorough uh, history uh, of exposure. And uh, even with that, uh, the 50% or more than 50% of the people uh, will not show any exposure history. So uh, MDT is important in uh, diagnosis in these patients. So you have to consider the clinical radiological data. And in some patients, you can do bronchiolular lavage and look for lymphocytosis, and then uh, some others, rarely you might uh, have to go for a histological uh, confirmation. The role of HRCT in HP, the, bron uh, the, inflama the bronchocentric inflammation seen on histopathology, which leads to a small, ill-defined ground glass nodules uh, with a profuse distribution across all the lung zones. In HP, this ground glass typically shows a patchy distribution, referred to as uh, mosaic attenuation. So this uh, shows the appearance of uh, centrilobular disease, centrilobular nodule appearance. Uh, this shows a uh, widespread ground glass with centrilobular nodules. And uh, one slide shows uh, the ground glass opacification with poorly defined centrilobular nodules. And the other one shows the mosaic attenuation. But these are actually not uh, diagnostic of uh, uh, hypersensitive pneumonitis. There are other instances, other con conditions that you have to consider, like mycoplasma infections. And uh, the various other conditions can mimic this appearance. And this shows uh, the AR trapping in patients with hypersensitive pneumonitis. So uh, right hand side you'll see the, uh, the uh, expiratory film showing the air trapping. The combination of a patchy distribution of a normal appearing lobule, normal uh, appearing uh, lobules, ground glass, and lobules of decreased lung density and vessel size is called the three density pattern, formerly uh, the head cheese sign, and is the CT pattern of greater specificity, specificity for HP. But still this can, uh, uh, be there in some patients with sarcoidosis and also with mycoplasma infection. So it is not the, the characteristic, 
But uh, with the clinical settings, if you see this, it's very uh, confirmatory, the hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So this is uh, that appearance. Uh, this is one of our patients with uh, uh, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which was bronchocentric septal thickening, patchy areas of ground loss, uh, opacities and consolidations, traction bronchiectasis and irregular reticular opacities with architectural deterioration, and sometimes honeycomb is suggesting UIP pattern. The pulmonary function test may be normal in acute HP. Uh, you will see a restrictive uh, functional uh, pattern. And this uh, P PFT is important uh, in assessing the patient. And later on, when you uh, start treatment, uh, you can repeat the test and see the progression. So moderate to severe uh, reduction of carbon monoxide diffusion capacity can be seen uh, like in our other uh, patient. Uh, sometimes you can see obstructive special, the features, especially uh, in some patients with farmer's lung. So this the appearance is uh, the uh, lung function tests are non-specific, but it is uh, uh, important in the follow-up. Six-minute fog test. Uh, again, some of the patients may not be hypoxic uh, at rest. And when you do six-minute fog test, you will find the hypoxemia. And again, you can repeat the test and um, uh, see uh, the progression of the disease. Bar lymphocytosis in HP, the bar is not indicated uh, for each and every patient with uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, but it is uh, if the exposure history is there and the radiological features are uh, very confirmatory, uh, you, may, you can uh, safely make the diagnosis. But if you do bar uh, lymphocytosis, you will find uh, more than 30% uh, uh, lymphocytes in these patients. Uh, lympho but the lymphocytosis can occur in other ILDs also, especially the CTT ILDs, you can uh, find the, uh, the bile lymphocytosis. Uh, in patients with fibrotic ILD, a bile lymphocyte counts more than 30% is uh, highly specific for HB. But the absence of lymphocytosis does not exclude HB. And the absence of lymphocytosis in non-fibrotic disease lowers the probability enough to exclude the possibility of HP. So if you see a non-fibrotic uh, non cellular type of uh, interstitial lung disease, and when you do BAL, and if you don't find more than 30% lymphocytes, it's unlikely that you are dealing with a case of uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Uh, then specific antibodies. Uh, you can uh, measure specific uh, circulating antibodies, and this shows uh, the evidence of uh, sensitization, and uh, this seen as a mark of exposure. A positive test in the appropriate clinical setting supports the diagnosis of HP, but false negative results may be seen in acute and uh, chronic HP cases. Uh, inhalation channel, yes, inhalation channel ch challenge in HP. Uh, this is highly sensitive and specific for HP, but can only be performed at expert centers. Then the biopsy, uh, very rarely uh, we uh, go ahead and do biopsies in interstitial lung diseases. Uh, and if you really uh, need biopsies, this should be decided at a multidisciplinary uh, team meeting. And the biopsy will show uh, two uh, key histopathic, histopathologic features of HP uh, include the lymphocytic uh, interstitial pneumonitis a poorly formed granuloma around a small airways. And in chronic HP, a fibrosis, architectural remodeling with septal and subplural uh, fibrosis as seen in uh, UIP. But without the honeycombing and fibroblast foci required for the diagnosis of UIP. The management of HP, the early diagnosis and avoidance of uh, exposure is the most important thing. Uh, exposures are not identified in up to 60% uh, of patients uh, with uh, hypersensitive pneumonitis. So uh, each and every time you uh, see that patient, uh, you have to go through a list of uh, possible agents and uh, inquire about the exposure. Uh, avoidance of smoking is uh, important. Uh, and the, in the improvements 
uh, in the industrial and agricultural uh, working conditions and also the cleaning the environment at home to minimize microbial or avian antigen exposure and the use of uh, air purifying respirators also suggested but uh, like in our case the, which presented earlier and it is very important to uh, remove all the, the possible antigens because uh, even after removing the birds uh, these antigens may be persisting for up to uh, six months so the patient can continue to have uh, the disease. Uh, HP initially responds to uh, corticosteroid, but uh, there is little evidence that corticosteroid provide a long-term benefit. Uh, systemic corticoids, although their long-term efficacy has not been approved in prospect to uh, clinical trials, in acute stages and the, the, the subacute patients, we always start on uh, corticosteroid, and we can uh, continue for a short period as mentioned in the first lecture. Uh, and the most important thing is to, you know, avoid the, uh, avoid the antigens if it is, uh, you know, known. Then uh, HP may initially respond to corticosteroid, but little evidence that the corticosteroid provide a long-term benefit. Now, if you look at the Panther IPF study, it is more harmful uh, to give uh, steroids uh, in IPF patients at uh, the chronic stage. So like in uh, the IPF, uh, some of our the, the patients with chronic, uh, the HP may be uh, behaving as uh, similar to IPF. So giving steroid at that point may be even harmful. And there are other treatment options um, include MMF, acetabrine, and rituximab. And there is no clear evidence to suggest to start on these drugs. But in selected patients uh, with uh, you know progressive inflammatory process, uh, you might decide to give MMF and acetabrine. Uh, Perfinidone, again, no uh, randomized control trials to uh, prove that perfinidone is uh, beneficial in uh, HP, uh, but still in some, some people use uh, perfinidone, and there is uh, conflicting evidence. And uh, nintidenib, in Bill's trial, the efficacy and safety of uh, nintidinib in patients with uh, progressive fibrosing interstitial lung diseases. And this, uh, in the use of uh, progressive fibrosing ILD, except uh, IPF, the, which consists of fibrotic HP, 26% uh, uh, of uh, the study, uh, 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 fibrotic HP. And this has uh, slowed the rate of uh, decline in FEC over 52 weeks by 57% compared to the placebo. And risk of an acute exacerbation of ILD also reduced, and death also was uh, reduced in this group, intitinib uh, group. So uh, this, uh, the intitinib has been uh, licensed in, uh, the, by the American uh, Food and Drug Authority to, use, uh, to be used in um, hypersensitive pneumonitis. So other treatment options include long-term oxygen therapy, ambulatory oxygen, pulmonary rehabilitation, vaccination, and management of uh, comorbidities like gastroesophageal reflux disease and the COPD. So these are some of the uh, bad, uh, the poor prognostic features, the old age, male sex, uh, genetic uh, predisposition, and um, unidentified uh, inciting uh, antigen, duration of exposure to inciting antigen, and history of smoking, low FVC at presentation, low DCL, DLCO, decline in FVC, and low bile lymphocytosis, and the presence of fibrosis on HRCT, and the extent of fibrosis on HRCT, the UIP pattern, and the UIP pattern in histology, and these are all uh, poor prognostic features. So in summary, HV is a complex and heterogeneous disease, Clinical, radiological, and histopathologic features overlap with those of other ILDs. So it may not be uh, possible to identify a culprit uh, uh, exposure in up to 60% uh, of these patients. Pathologically, HP is characterized by a bronchocentric granulomatous lymphocytic alveolitis, which evolves to fibrosis in chronic advanced cases. On HRCT, the ground glass opacities and poorly defined nodules 
with patchy areas of air trapping are seen in acute subacute cases, whereas reticular opacities, volume loss, and traction bronchiectasis superimposed on subacute changes are observed in chronic cases. The presence of lung fibrosis on HRCT has important implications for prognosis and management. The patients with HP should be regularly monitored to assess for progression. Uh, wherever possible, the inciting antigen should be avoided and uh, smoking should be stopped. Immunosuppression, in commonly used, immunosuppression is commonly used in the treatment of HP but has not been shown to slow the progression of fibrotic disease. Uh, Nintididap is an approved treatment option for fibrotic HP with a progressive phenotype. Thank you. And I think the Nintididap is uh, available in our hospital practice, although perfinidinone is not there. So uh, in our HP patients, the chronic HP patients, we can try and see. Thank you very much. So for that excellent talk, uh, indeed it is a pleasure to have you here, my mentor uh, in respiratory medicine. Uh, there are a few uh, questions from our online viewers. Uh, what are the commonest causes of HP in Sri Lanka? Yeah, commonest cause? Like I don't think uh, anyone has done a study, but uh, we come across a lot of patients with uh, these bird fanciers, lung, the poultry workers, and uh, the, then the pigeons. And uh, so those are the ones, but uh, there may be a lot of uh, unidentified causes. So each and every time when you come across uh, the features suggestive of uh, HP, so you have to go into the details. And sometimes you are supposed to do a home visit to diagnose uh, HP. And there may be, uh, 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 and uh, the, especially these, uh, the bird fanciers, uh, pigeon fanciers lung. And those patients, uh, they might not come with this history, even if you ask, but they don't want to, you know, uh, remove the birds from their uh, home place. So uh, I don't think uh, anyone has done a study, but you know, these are the type of uh, patients that we see commonly. These pigeon fanciers are very difficult to treat because uh, when I was at, uh, I had few cases, like there were murder cases for pigeons, like, you know, they are very fancy on them. And how common is the paddy? Exposure, like paddy harvest, uh, uh, mm. sometimes the paddy uh, stored in houses yeah, yeah. and villages. That is like one of the causes, and uh, we, we have come across, but you know, we have not proven the, the presence of uh, antibodies and you know, the presence of uh, precipitants in these patients. And in fact, if, uh, if we have the chance of doing that and proving uh, these things, would be better. And there are uh, patients who are keeping this uh, paddy at home. Uh, and they are uh, exposed to uh, everyday exposure is there. I don't know. Ancient Sri Lanka, they used to keep paddy outside the... That means uh, that's the, the, uh, one of the... Sand. Yeah, that may be <laughs> the reason that they were keeping uh, the paddy outside. And uh, there was uh, another question from the viewers. Can COVID give rise to HP? Uh, I don't know. Uh, by definition, the, uh, the, the hypersensitivity in pneumonitis is due to... Uh, uh, exposure to organic dust and uh, any bacteria, any virus, you know, the, the antigens can cause this one, but this is uh, the COVID, uh, what we are talking about, mainly the, mainly yeah. the organizing uh, pneumonia, but not the hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And there was an, another question. That is following infection. The duration of the treatment required for HP. Uh, duration, again, there are no, no studies to uh, tell you the duration. So that is why the, in the management of uh, hypersense, uh, any, any ILD, you are supposed to have, uh, uh, supposed to have multidisciplinary team meetings. And uh, it should be decided uh, individual basis. And depending on the presentation of this patient, one has to uh, decide. And there are some patients who can't, you know, who can't avoid the possible, uh, possible exposure because that is related to their job. And uh, in that case, uh, you may have to, you know, continue giving low doses of steroids and all. So that should be decided on an individual basis in a, in a multidisciplinary team meeting. And there was two questions asking uh, exposure of children to this uh, organic dust. Uh, who can frequently cause? Uh, 
uh, I, I have uh, not seen any patients, you know, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, that is, uh, ch the children with uh, hypersensitivity and pneumonitis. I don't know why. Uh, I uh, don't know uh, whether there are, there are any cases in the literature, and uh, especially all these patients are adults that we have seen. I have no uh, idea about the, the children presenting with hypersensitive pneumonitis. And the cats and dogs, well, mm -hmm. is there any risk with them? Sorry? Uh, having cats and dogs at home uh, for the children? No. But it is uh, no, not described with, uh, they don't talk about no, it. Otherwise, you know, these uh, cats and dogs are very common in uh, European no, uh, uh, society, not, and uh, they may have done some uh, precipitin test and all. So uh, if it is, due, and they have not described this. Thank you, Dr. Kulratna, for that excellent presentation. And right. all the speakers, on behalf of Silangal, I will thank. Uh, someone just wait for this. Yeah, on, for all the speakers, we have a certificate of appreciation. Uh, would I like to ask Pudika to join me? Please. Please.